cracking. You can see, I do a lot of these to camera clubs around the UK. Um, and I don't really know why I'm going to show you this next image because you can see me right now. But there's me. That's what I look like <laughs> as of a few days ago. But this is what I look like as of, well, live right now. Um, and here's a really cheesy shot of me that, you know, every photographer has to get done in the studio at some point. And if it's not black and white, then it's not serious. Let's move on. Right. So I I studied at the Glasgow School of Art many years ago. Um, my goodness. Well, 20 years ago. Graduated in 2001, um, which means we're due a reunion soon. Um, we'll see if we can organise that now that things are easing up. Um, but it was, a, it was a wonderful art school. And this is where my, not only where my journey into photography started to blossom, um, but this is where I began to pioneer um, this, this style of, of macro photography that I seem to be best known for involving little people who you'll meet shortly. Um, so my journey with photography began with macro photography, I guess that's the way to remember it, and later on further down the line, which I'll, I'll touch upon shortly. Um, it evolved, as often these kind of creative journeys do, and I became obsessed with another process called light painting, long exposure night photography. We'll look at a bit of that again shortly. So after art school, I made the, the most illogical, but lovely decision actually, as it turned out, decision to move um, from Scotland down to the sunny island of Guernsey in the Channel Islands. Because I kind of got spat out the other end of art school um, at the, the, the age of 21 and had no idea how to create um, a livelihood, shall we say, out of photography or as an artist in terms of starting a business. I tried to, you know, I had a couple of solo exhibitions. They didn't get me very far. And my sister was, or still is, living in Guernsey, said to me, well, why don't you come down here, try and get a job, because I had a degree now. Um, and that's exactly what I did. Uh, the initial plan being that I'd stay for six months and return with a few quid and, you know, with fresh fresh kind of impetus, restart my, my photography career. But six months turned out to be 14 years, a French wife and a baby girl. Um, it's amazing how these things evolve. Um, it flew by. And interestingly, when I moved to Guernsey, um, I'll show you a couple of images of Guernsey here, or one or two. But we'll come back to them in a bit. When I lived in Guernsey, I it was a really interesting phase. This in the early 2000s, photography went from being primarily film photography to digital. Digital photography was really starting to gain um, speed in terms of how that was all evolving in the background. Just when I left Scotland, and I actually put shameful this, I kind of put the camera down for about four years, got swept up into the the world of offshore finance. Believe it or not, as my other career started. To develop um, and then kind of happy mistake really I inherited my first digital camera in about 2005 from my sister at Christmas time and it sat there for about a year gathering dust and eventually the guilt became too strong and I decided to pick it up and restart my journey into photography and it started with images the reason you're seeing this one not just to show you a bit of Guernsey's coast but it's kind of established, I guess, the beginning to my story back to photography at this point. Um, I primarily focused on landscape photography at that time, but mainly long exposure photography. And we're going to come back and look at that shortly. But first, we're just going to kind of fly through how this story's evolved. So here's me creating uh, one of my little dioramas using the, the little people. We'll look at this again in a short while. I've created a mini series all about the pandemic, um, funny enough, called Pandemic. Uh, why Why would I make work about anything else right now? That's why I focused on a lot heavily uh, last year. Um, I'm just going to show you a very small selection of some miniature works here as we kind of press forward. This is me in my home studio. So when I moved back to Scotland with my family in uh, 2015, um, my my one rule, should we say, um, with my with the understanding of my wife was that I needed, or rather wanted and also needed, um, my own room stroke studio, stroke kind of home gallery space in which I could think and make work. Um, and that's what I've luckily been able to obtain. So the house that we're living in has a, an upstairs room that I've got pretty much all to myself when my daughter's not trying to play with the little people as well. Um, so here's me looking really moody and overly cool in my studio. This, this shot was taken last year for Adobe, who I worked with in a really cool project, and they wanted a... They wanted a selfie uh, of me in my working environment. So that's why I look so unimpressed in this photo. I'm not used to taking pictures of myself. 
So here are the little people. Um, I can actually hold them up in front of the camera as well. For those that aren't overly familiar, they really are tiny. Millie, you know all about these. Um, they're about two centimeters tall. They're absolutely minute. Um, and they come in an array of different fixed poses. And it's kind of my, it's become my job, if you like, as a, an artist to kind of give them a job to do. And so that's where the skill set really comes in and what I do. I kind of reappropriate these model railway figurines into scenes to give my artwork meaning and so on. As I mentioned briefly earlier, my journey feels like it's very much split in two halves. I've got the macro photography, which I'm deeply passionate about. And then when I was in Guernsey, and as a kind of offshoot to the landscape work that I was making down there, I became very interested in long exposure night photography. And that naturally led me into the very interesting, the fascinating world of painting with light. Um, and we're going to look at some example images of that a little later on. You see a couple here. So what's going on here, just to explain this really quickly, I'll talk you through this in more detail shortly. This is nighttime. You can see if you look at the sky, the, the stars trailing across the, the skyline, that gives you a kind of rough indication of the time that's been passing during this exposure. The camera is sat in a tripod, so it's held completely still. And during the long exposure, which was about five minutes long for this, this specific shot we're looking at, I walk into the, the, the scene that's being photographed and move around bizarre light contraptions in the dark. Um, and the light freezes into the image. And if I'm really careful not to illuminate myself and I wear dark clothing, I'm able to just blend into the dark landscape and remain invisible. And I actually have my lightsaber. If you look at the screen, I've got this just quickly to show you. This is the kind of tool that I use to, in fact, this is the tool that I use to make those ribbons you can see at the bottom. It changes color and I just kind of walked into the shot dressed in black clothing and moved the device slowly up and down along the ground. So light painting, a truly magical, magically creative art form in its own right. Now, Anne, you're going to do me for copyright here, aren't you? This is your photograph of me teaching in the festival two years ago. I wanted to get this image in here, a couple of them actually, because this is how my journey into the um, with, with the Stirling Photography Festival began. Um, Janie can give a thumbs up to that. I, I think Janie picked up on my work online um, and asked me if I'd be interested in attending the festival in 2019 and introducing some participants to a light painting workshop, um, which I did. It was hugely enjoyable and which we're fingers crossed hoping to manage again this year at some stage. Um, so here's me teaching uh, a bunch of people about light painting just before the lights go out and we started making some really exciting work. And just a, not even a plug, but just this is kind of to get you guys all early on while we're still awake in the Zoom call. If you want to contact me after the uh, the talk this evening, feel free to find me on my website um, or Instagram or Facebook. Uh, you, I'm very happy to receive emails and questions. So feel free to take a quick screenshot if you want to remember these details or write them down. Um, you'll find me online and um, I'm very happy to chat to you if you want to find out anything more about what we talk about this evening. I wrote a couple of books last year during lockdown um, as I scratched my head and wondered how on earth, what on earth I do next when all my workshops ground to a halt. Um, and I randomly became an author, which was rather interesting. Um, something I've wanted to do for a very long time actually was to kind of distill all of my learnings and thoughts into a couple of books. Um, firstly, about macro, macro photography um, and also light painting because <clears throat> I was getting a lot of requests by email and through Facebook and Instagram during uh, lockdown, especially last year, as people found themselves, you know, trapped at home, working out how to be creative in an enclosed space. And of course, if we just go back to thinking about macro photography, there's nothing, nothing better than uh, than the world of macro, because uh, all you need is a very small space in which to work. And so a lot of people responded really strongly to this, this book and bought it through my website so they could learn about how to make uh, macro photography art during lockdown which was lovely. Lots of school teachers and uh, students as well. It's been quite a fascinating journey for me in that respect. Right, we're gonna jump into the next folder in just a few seconds. Uh, Megan, if there's any questions at this stage, feel free to shout them out before we jump into the next bit. Um, we've got one from Sam McDermott. Um, he's from Stirling. He's saying, I love your, di uh, your diorama work, David. How out of hand is your miniature scenery collection? <laughs> Uh, it's pretty out of hand. I actually, I kind of busy myself in my, well, 
it's quite an interesting period in which to ask me that actually, because this year specifically, I tried to, I tried and thankfully succeeded to make a hundred dioramas in a hundred days, um, starting New Year's Day. So that journey ended on the tenth of April last month, and you should have seen the state of my studio after those hundred scenes had been created, because I was just kind of picking things up, reusing them, making a new scene, um, and repeat every day. Uh, I spent hours yesterday reorganizing my my drawers and cabinets behind me where all of the little people live. Um, I'd love to say they're all filed alphabetically, depending on what it is they're meant for. Um, they're not quite, but I do have drawers that contain like workers, you know, like little working little people, um, sunbathers, um, adult themed little people that are a bit more risky, a bit sketchier. Um, they feature in my work from time to time. Uh, so yeah, I'm pretty organized. I think when you've got, I've, I've probably got a thousand plus uh, tiny figurines in my collection now, probably a lot more than that actually. So I've got to be fairly organized if I want to make work um, efficiently, which I do sometimes when I get commissioned. So yeah, keyword organization. Right, let's move on to the uh, the next folder. And we'll take a look at some poster and festival related work. So there's, there's been a couple of festivals now. I think it started in 2019, if I'm not mistaken, Jenny. Um, that's when the festival kind of formally kicked off. I think it is. Sorry, um, sorry, I couldn't find myself on the screen. No, 2018, David. 2018. Okay, well, my involvement began in 2019. That's when the festival began, all right? No, I'm joking. <laughs> um, but there's been, there's been some lovely some lovely collaborative efforts created along the way throughout the festivals. And I thought we'd start just by taking a very quick look at last year's poster because last year was such a memorable year for some very wrong reasons and some very more pleasant reasons as well. And um, the great Earl, as he's known, um, Jonathan made this, this lovely poster. And something I spoke, spoke to Janie about before I was tasked with, um, and gratefully tasked with designing this year's poster was that the last couple of posters for the festivals felt quite urban in terms of focusing on Stirling um, as a city, something I didn't consciously address when I was making my, creating my, my diorama, my scene that I photographed for the festival, um, but surely a subconscious thought because, you know, after all these lockdowns, I'm sure we can all relate to this kind of craving for being outdoors more, especially as spring and summer begin. So here's this year's, this year's poster, um, slightly zoomed in version, I'll show you a bit larger. We arrived, this was this is the final image that's this year's poster. Um, I hope you like it. And this was, uh, I guess, a, a small step away from what I, I normally create. I normally fix fix my scenes in a smaller area, but because I wanted the, the image to represent both photography in, in terms of one of the themes, because it's a photography festival, and because I wanted it to somehow speak of Stirling as a place, but maybe not as the city, uh, which is, like I say, perhaps why I focused on the countryside aspect of it, because it's surrounded by wonderful landscape. Um, and also this theme of, of flow for this year's festival. Um, hopefully I incorporated successfully all three kind of elements into the poster. And I spoke to Janie at length, you know, from beginning to end about these, these key themes and, and how the image should perhaps, should, should perhaps speak about each. Um, and this is, the, this is the resulting image that I created based upon various discussions and and various dioramas that I kind of tested out uh, on the lead up to the final piece. Um, here's me making the work. Yeah, can you tell that's an unplanned shot? <laughs> Rigid, um, just like the figurines. Um, but yeah, the making of shots are always quite nice to see. They also give you a, a really nice sense of just how small uh, these, these figurines are. And because of the theme of flow, I, did, I not only wanted to incorporate a river uh, to give that kind of literal sense of flow without maybe a small waterfall being added as well, but I used a, a kind of rolling cotton fabric as well, which is, strangely enough, my, my wife's scarf. She kind of wondered where that was for a couple of days. Um, only a couple of blobs of glue on it. I don't think she's noticed yet. So I think I got away with it. And here are all the props kind of deconstructed that constitute the, uh, the diorama that I, I built and photographed. We've got the, uh, yeah, the infamous scarf there. We've got the little cutout of card that I used, glittery card I used for the river. The trees, the figurines, um, and last but not least, Jenny, your photograph of the Wallace Monument in Stirling. Um, and, you know, we, we speak about, I've spoken to Jenny about these festivals in the past, um, sometimes brief conversations, sometimes at length. And one of the most pleasant aspects of anything that is a festival is this kind of collaborative 
sense of togetherness when when something like a, a festival commences and and you know throughout the duration of it and you know this this little project that we worked on little project was was no different um i kind of bounced ideas back and forwards for, off off jenny to kind of get to where we we got in the end um i, I love collaborative projects uh and events and this this year's kind of festival poster project was uh, was equally satisfying to many other experiences in the past of, of a similar nature. We'll look at a very brief, let me just see how I play this. Here it is here, because I'm sharing my screen slightly differently. Here's a kind of construction, if you like, a small time lapse of the scene being built piece by piece. Um, it may look ridiculously simplistic when everything's put together in a seamless manner like this, but my goodness, it's uh, Millie, as you'll be able to relate to having worked with, with tiny figurines, it's um, it can be a slightly painful process at times. I mean, these these little guys are tiny, and even just the little trees that I was adding to the scene. As soon as I moved the fabric, you know, a millimeter to the left or right, two or three of them would fall down. And um, you can stick things down all you like, but when something's moving around like this, you know, they 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 were just falling over, and the figurines were incredibly sensitive as well. And so there's normally a very short time frame I always find for the more complicated scenes that I construct for document, not only documenting them for the purposes of what you're looking at right now, but also the, the final shot because the light's constantly changing. I use ambient light very often when I'm shooting my scenes because I work on a desk at home um, and the windows that offer the light in my studio, you know, as the clouds change, as the, as the sun moves around, the light's constantly changing. Um, I use torches uh, rather interestingly. Um, some of you photographers out there might find this kind of interesting. But when I'm illuminating my scenes, not only am I relying on the ambient light in my studio, if I want to create more suggestive lighting from the left or from the right or above, I use a, a range of specific torches that I own, partly because I'm a light painter and I've got loads of torches in my collection, which is a bonus. Um, but they're really, they're, it's a really practical way of lighting the scenes because the sets are really quite small and contained. And here is the set. There, there are the windows. Um, there is my desk and tweezers and torches um, all together in one shot. How about that? Um, it does look really basic, doesn't it? And I, I, I've always kind of prided myself on this aspect, I think, with the dioramas that I create. I am very much allergic to Photoshop. Um, I've never used it ever. Um, I don't over edit my work. I like to capture what I intend on capturing in one uh, final shot with very min minimal tweaking thereafter. Um, and so that's why it's so important to get the dioramas just right before I capture the final version. Here's my desk. Again, this shot was for Adobe last year. It's looking a bit more organized than it normally does. Everything laid out in what looks like an organized and sensible fashion. Um, it doesn't always look like that. It's quite clear right now as I prepare for the next thing that I'm going to be making. And there you go, Janie. There's your uh, your famous Wallace Monument photograph. <laughs> Extra plus. And here is the beautiful logo for this year's festival, because as I mentioned earlier, the theme for this year's festival is flow. And how's that for a cool logo? Gorgeous. Here's one of the early, I wouldn't call this a suggested final idea that I was proposing at the time. I was speaking to Janie about, you know, various ideas and approaches I might employ along the way uh, before reaching our kind of final uh, image, our final concept for this year's poster. And I, I really enjoy photo mosaics. I've made quite a few over the years. Um, and I thought it'd be interesting, at least visually, to see how it would look, creating, in a very literal sense, this, this theme of flow by using my, my miniature dioramas. This, this particular image is made up of something like, my goodness, it's at least 500 um, dioramas, miniature scenes that I've created over the years. Um, the idea being that when you zoom up in, into any particular area of the image, there's a different scene that's been set up, some multiple ones as well. Um, but this, this was an initial idea. We weren't necessarily over, overly keen on, certainly not the, the nature of that image that we're looking at. And this was another idea that I kind of stumbled upon along the way as well. And this is why the collaborative nature of working on something like this became so important, because when, when you're a creative or, or an artist and when you're the one tasked with making the work, you can kind of get the blinkers on sometimes and you can have an idea that makes very clear sense to you because you've thought it through in your own mind and you followed a peculiar creative logic that you're adamant will make sense to everyone else that looks at the image. But with the theme of this year's festival is flow, this, this image really didn't speak about that. It's quite, well, it's blocky. <laughs> There's a nice pun, but it is, it's static. It's, it's very immovable. And 
the idea that I had was this, I still quite like the idea, I will use this image, I will repurpose it for something eventually, but the, the idea was that this, rep, this image represented the flow of season, so the idea was that it started with spring at the top, it slowly moved down into summer, into the warmer colours, and then as the colours became cooler towards the bottom, you had more autumnal and winter scenes as well. And the idea was that we'd split it up into, you know, the flow of the seasons into different areas. But visually, <clears throat> albeit quite pretty to look at, it really didn't talk about the key cornerstones of this year's festival in terms of flow, sterling photography festival. And so we kind of meandered on through in and out of various ideas. This was a, a far more simplistic image that I bounced off Jenny, not as a, again, a final poster idea in itself, but we spoke about a more literal approach to this idea of flow and movement. And I've made several images uh, insinuating you know, water or waves, um, including this one. And we spoke about that for a little while before we eventually settled on, on the post that we looked at earlier uh, with the, the Stirling kind of Stirlingshire landscape. <clears throat> so back to light painting, we're going to speak about this briefly because this was again an idea that we considered um, when discussing the idea Oh, and maybe taking my light painting practice into the, the Stirling landscape. Not as straightforward. I, I have to work hard to, to make this kind of work. Not that that was off-putting, um, but with the restrictions we had just over a month ago, it did prove slightly problematic. But I do love the, the feeling of, of flowing light through an image and this journey that light takes during a long exposure. And we did kind of <clears throat> discuss this idea um, briefly as well something that can be used to great effect elsewhere, I'm sure. So there's some images that are more specifically about the poster. We'll take a brief break again, Megan, if there are any questions before we look at a more kind of, perhaps a broader range of my macro work. Um, and then we'll look at some light painting work after that. So feel free to share any questions out if you've got any right now. Yep, uh, there's a couple of questions. Um, one from Matt Lewis. Um, did the Pete Bog Fairies Black House album cover, is that one of your light painting images? I don't know, is it? I, I'm not sure I know the album cover. What's the album cover again? Sorry, Pete. Um, Pete Bog Fairies Black House album cover. No, oh, I don't know it. Um, fire it to me on Facebook or Instagram or something. Let me have a look. And then we've got, um, did you take inspiration from David Leventhal when creating your Little People photography? Yes, yes, I did. Um, the book that I wrote touches on this quite nicely in, in the first chapter. Because it's it's been a it's been fascinating to watch how this this theme this style if you like this technique of photography has evolved over the last 20, 25 years. When and during my first year at art school, I felt very much like many pupils do in the early years of of, of uni or art school. I felt pretty baffled by the whole process um, about needing to be individual and stand out and create my own style. It didn't. It, it's not something you can force to happen quickly sometimes and. I had no idea what direction my photography journey was going to take at that point. And after my first year at art school of kind of flailing around a little bit, you know, I did some portraiture and some, some landscape work. And then my tutor, well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the story really briefly. I actually witnessed a quite a horrible accident taking place um, whilst waiting in a dental surgery, believe it or not. I was up on the third or fourth floor of a dental surgery and I heard this huge crashing noise in the street beneath me. And a lorry had uncoupled from its load at the back that had then landed on a car in the adjacent lane, pinning the car and passenger to the ground. They were fine, by the way. They, they got retrieved after a couple of hours and miraculously escaped unharmed. But when I was watching, the reason I'm talking about this bizarre incident, when I was watching this scene unfold um, in the streets below, because of my high vantage point, it felt like I was watching, I felt very detached from what was going on in, in one regard but maybe not a conscious thought at the time, but one that came back to me later on, it, it felt very much like looking at the, the toys I played with as a young boy, the figurines, there was an ambulance, there were, you know, the ambulance workers, the fire crew were there, there was a car, there was a lorry, um, all of these things that, I, you know, I think I've still got some of them, that were in my, my toy collection as a very young boy. And when you're a young chap or a young girl and you're playing with these kind of things, um, you kind of mimic accidents. It's one of these things that teaches you how to learn. The act of play teaches you a lot of, about life. And that, that theme really interested me um, as I became an adult, should we say, because what happens to a toy when it's removed from the context of a child's control and you as an adult or as an artist uses it to create work? Is it still a toy? 
if you remove it from the context entirely, is it just an object? And I played around with that idea for a while. And that drew me into the world of figurines because what I did in a slightly kind of macabre way, I guess, I re reconstructed the, the accident scene from the street beneath me with miniature figurines and showed that to my, my class in the second year of art school. And that was the moment my tutors kind of head bobbed up and they said, this is interesting, you're onto something here. Um, look, up, look out for the work of David Leventhal, this US photographer. And that was the first time I'd encountered his work. And back then in the early 2000s, he was already very well established. And I think I could only find two or three other artists globally working with miniatures in, in their artwork. And since helping to pioneer this style, shall we say, as an artist and photographer, um, and partly because I teach others about it and write books about it, I mean, and like Millie that's, that's listening and watching right now, many hundreds and thousands of other photographers have, have delved into this fascinating world of, of miniatures and figurines, which is lovely to think about especially because it helped so many people in the last year during all these lockdowns and so on. But the, the very quick answer is yes, I know David Leventhal's work. He was my, he was my initial inspiration. There's your short answer. You're not going to get many short answers tonight. <laughs> Should we crack on? All right. Let's take a look at some, some macro work, a broader range of my miniature series. As I mentioned earlier, and let's keep things nice and relevant as we start this slideshow, um, I made a bunch of images uh, titled Pandemic based on last, year, last year's and this year's experiences. And my work focused on using things like hand gel and face masks and so on in the, in the scenes. And I found this process not only cathartic as I kind of walked my way through my own emotions and feelings about what was going on, but I wanted to harness, you know, what was happening around me and all of us um, and create create art out of it. That's what we're meant to do as artists, I think, at times. And this, this series kind of popped out the other end of all of that. And I was very nervous about showing this work last year when I first created it, because I normally kind of create themes of work, bodies of work. Um, I've touched on themes like plastic pollution in the past, um, climate change. I'm working on a series about that just now. And this particular series was being created during, you know, the period of time that everyone was most concerned. And so I really, really worried before I kind of released this work online through social media and through media outlets and so on, how people would respond to it because the fear of using toys or figurines um, to convey a serious theme or message is always that you might be accused of trivializing matters um, and nothing could be further from the truth in terms of how I feel about things, but it's always something I've slightly feared. Um, I think it's just because I'm a human being and that's naturally maybe what you do. Um, but I kind of showed my work to a few good friends that are very honest and they all agreed, two or three of them agreed in succession that the work didn't feel like it was trivializing matters. It was, it was highlighting what was happening and perhaps adding a bit of humor to what was an incredibly dark period, which continues to be a really dark period. And that's something that's this probably pre prevalent in all of my work, maybe not my light painting work so much, that's completely different, but then the macro work always carries a kind of unavoidable layer of humor um, because what you're looking at is in itself kind of funny. You know, I'm, I'm reappropriating figurines into scenarios and scenes where they're used to convey ideologies and, and, and stories about what's either going on around us or what has been. Um, and just that in essence, a bit like, you know, Gulliver's Travels, there's something quite comedic about that. But because the objects, let's call them objects, the figurines are figurative in nature, they can actually be used to great effect in terms of conveying serious themes and ideas because people respond very strongly, I find, to this work because it is figurative in nature. And interestingly, albeit these, these images are completely fictional because they're two centimeter tall figures, you know, can, and featuring in tiny, tiny sets and scenes. The skill, I believe, seems to lie in, in just suspending this disbelief for a momentary second or two when people encounter the work. So that when people encounter these images, they're not only kind of slightly humorous, but they draw the viewer in on a, on a deeper level because they're believable to a degree. They're never gonna be fully believable because of what the subject matter is. But that mask, if you like, of, of convincingness that I can sometimes apply if it's shot well enough, allows people to access what's going on in the image on a deeper level. 
um, than if the images were either shot slightly less effectively. That's why I use a very shallow depth of field in a lot of my work to help draw the eye into what's actually going on in the scene. You'll, you'll find in a lot of my work, it's not sharp from back to front. It's normally quite blurry around the, the, the main essence of what's going on. Um, and so anyway, we're, we're now moving away from the pandemic theme, as you've no doubt garnered, and we're into some of the images I shot this year during the um, another massive lockdown. Um, and just as well, because I think my my 100 days ended pretty much exactly as the lockdown ended, which was rather coincidental. Um, so this kept me out of trouble. This one's called The Quick Brush With Death. Isn't that just dreadful? I'm not going to give you the titles for the uh, the work tonight. You can make up your own, own minds on those. There are some dreadful puns along the way. I won't, I won't let you suffer that all evening, don't worry. I often use food in my work. It's something that's that's never been an, an, a sort of obvious intention. Um, but I think the scale of the figurines and food in general, they seem to work incredibly well together. And I've really enjoyed over the years working with, with various food items and, and the little people. And um, here's an egg carton. I, I created again a, a sub series during lockdown in I think it was February called Explore Indoor because we're all forced to uh, stay indoors again. And so I created my own little expeditions um, inside my own home using some explorers who walked along zips on my jackets and explored egg boxes and so on. This was a really a real fun theme to, to work on actually. I sometimes use little trees. That Jenny will probably pick up on the fact that this helped kind of maybe inform what happened with the, the Sterling Photography Festival poster. Um, I've made several images that use clothing and materials to kind of help give the sense of a landscape. And I think we spoke about this image in particular, didn't we, in terms of how to steer the final image. Um, and once you said that, I knew exactly what to do next. And that's the poster evolved pretty quickly thereafter, I remember. These are just little colored pencils trying to recreate a lavender field. And the back of one of my hiking boots. Right, I'll tell you what, I'll pick up the speed because I've got quite a lot of images in here. We'll see how many we can get through. So these images that we're looking at right now all represent this kind of explore indoor theme from February and March that I worked on. And I did kind of fabricate several summer holidays and vacation scenes. Um, I told you the work was cathartic. Can you tell what I'm painting for right now? Uh, I also created a little series using a miniature airplane. I also own a couple of guinea pigs, um, just a little FYI. So I often have a lot of fresh veg in the house, which is quite handy. <laughs> I told you I had some adult themed figurines. There's a slightly more risque scene. I've always enjoyed this notion of creating scenes that are a little dodgier um, using figurines that are rather weirdly meant for model railway sets because you, you should see some of the figurines that I've purchased over the years. I'm really not sure who's got a model railway set that's got a strip bar and various things going on. Um, anyway, all the more fun for me. Here's a flasher in front of my iPhone. Another lovely beach scene. And my backdrops are really, really, I mean, you'd, you'd laugh if you saw what I used to create some of my scenes. It's very kind of blue, Peter. I'll use a, a piece of card on the foreground, maybe another piece of card like you've got going on in this scene, a glittery piece of blue card to get that kind of sparkly effect and mimic water in the background. And then literally a piece of blue card with some cotton wool stuck all over it to, to kind of create the, the visual effect of a cloudy sky. Here we are inside a pepper, pepper pioneer. And I have looked at waffles several times over the years. This is a really weird sentence. I've looked at waffles a few times and just thought I need to use them somehow. And then it just kind of really obviously clicked that they look like little houses. <laughs> so I've, I've used them several times now as blocks of flats. We looked at that one briefly earlier, I think. 
And my poor wee daughter, she's got asthma. So we've got these little asthma inhalers in the house. Um, and so I thought they looked like little chimneys. And so that's what they became. And that's, that's as uh, detailed or as complex as my editing gets. Uh, that image was uploaded into Lightroom, which a lot of photographers use. And I just added a little bit of lightning above each of them to create a really gentle smoke kind of effect. Um, I don't know how to use Photoshop. That's about as complicated as things get for me. Well, I had a question about the editing as well. Um, Lindsay's asked, um, she said that all the colours in your photos are so rich. And you also mentioned that you don't use Photoshop. So do you enhance your colours or is it just how they come out on camera? I don't enhance them. Um, I just I just go to the craft shop and buy... I've, I've got a lot of card in my studio. I, I just, they love me in that hobby craft shop. I just go in there and buy sheets and sheets and sheets of different colored cards and use them as foregrounds and backgrounds and so on. Um, and as you'll see, this is actually quite a good example of this shot here. And then because I use torch light uh, sometimes to, to pick out highlights, it, it brings the color out of the card really nicely. When the, when the studio is a little bit darker and I'm not relying so much on ambient light from the windows, maybe in the evening or nighttime, when I use the torch light, the colours really jump because the torch picks them out really nicely. Um, and Anne has asked as well, um, how like, do you backlight the darker images? Do I backlight the darker images? Sometimes, yes. So, yeah, I, because, because I use torches to, to create the lighting, I, I use them in so many different ways. I sometimes backlight my images if I want to rely on maybe silhouettes or color coming through a more transparent card material, I'll, or more often than not, I'll use them from the sides to help illuminate the scene. Um, it changes every image that I shoot. Um, but because they're so, because I can be so dynamic with the torches and move them in between every single take, it's a really quick way of making work and changing the lighting um, between takes. So within the space of a few seconds, I can have two or three different images that look completely different because of how I've moved the, moved the light sources around. It's a good question. But yes, I do sometimes. This one was shot directly from above just to kind of give that kind of uh, beam me up feel. And again, a slightly dodgier image. This is meant to be a kind of brothel. Um, this one's called Roxanne. And this was backlit Anne. <laughs> because it's helped illuminate the waffle and, and the little rooms therein. And you can see a bunch of people in the uh, in the window areas. But I'm really I'm really compelled by this idea of of creating images that are of more kind of adult themed work, but using figurines that are for something completely different. I find that whole task rather rather compelling and interesting. Depending on my audience, of course. Told you the waffle was used a few times. I use toys as well in some of my work. We're not going to look at that so much tonight, but I do own a whole bunch of, um, you know, kind of three to six inch figures from Star Wars and Marvel and so on. Maybe slightly riskier to use them in terms of copyright reasons and so on. Um, it's a very interesting discussion that we could, we could spend a whole hour talking just about that, in fact. But um, I've got a whole series of toy stuff that you'll find on my website and you'll probably find it quite amusing. Back to the little people and a bit more Star Wars. Right, we'll speed these up a little bit. So get ready to absorb them every two seconds. We'll see if we can get into the next folder before I've we have I've got a question just as we're um, sort of flicking through uh, the photos. Samantha Green has said, um, I think the pandemic series was fantastic and bring in some fun and lightheartedness. Uh, as you said, a very sensitive subject during the time people needed it most. Um, do you think that this had been your favourite and most rewarding series, and if not, what has been? Very good. Oh, nice one, Sam. That's a really good question. And Sam knows as, as, as well as anyone, I've also got a Corona calendar that's on sale in the Made in Stirling store. Um, I was even bold enough to turn the images into a calendar, just to remind everyone month and month, month this year what's been going on, in case you forget. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, that's a really good question. I, I think from a kind of deep and meaningful perspective. It might change this year, actually, as I work on this climate change series that I've started working on, because I feel quite emotional making that work. Uh, that, I believe, will become really quite important um, as it evolves. I'm only a few images into that. 
But the, the one that sticks out for me was a series I made all about plastic pollution. Um, and I made, I spent days and days with my, my young family collecting, you know, plastic detritus from, from beauty spots around the west coast of Scotland. And we bagged it all up and brought it home. And I tried, I, I spent a few days thinking about how I could use it as an art project before we recycled it. And the little people came to my aid because I then returned to each of those beauty spots that were, you know, Loch Lomond, uh, the Isle of Butte, Arran, all these lovely areas that were just littered with plastic and, um, and placed the plastic very casually back into the scene and then placed the little people on or in the plastic to interact with it. And as I sometimes do when I've got a kind of complete series of work finished, um, I've got a press agent who sometimes rolls it out to the media and that stuff went, um, it went, I hate the word, but it kind of went viral. It went everywhere. It went all around the world. Um, and this is a really random comment, really random thing, but I think it was the president of Costa Rica or something like that. Um, his assistant or somebody that knew him messaged me of a picture of him next to an image of my work that they used in a festival out there to help raise awareness about plastic pollution. I don't know. Who, I don't know who the guy is. I can't even remember his name, uh, sadly, but um, that was really quite amazing. It, it just went bonkers. It was all over Yahoo News and MSN and China, India, Japan, America. Um, and the, the whole point behind making those, those particular series, it's never about making money because you can't, no one's going to buy that kind of work for the wall, essentially. Um, I, I don't think they would anyway. It's, some of it's quite grim. But it's to help raise awareness, you know, as, as, as a creative, as an artist, I like to do that every so often when something, when I feel strongly compelled to do so. Uh, and it was lovely just to see how, how that work traveled the, the world and helped people engage with that key theme of, of polluting the environment and plastic waste and so on. Um, most of the battle is probably about awareness uh, before you know we can make progress with these things. And it felt like the work started to do that, which was lovely for me. So that was that's the one that stands out. I think the pandemic one will live, uh, you know, long in, in my memory for sure, um, for different reasons. And I'll let you all know, or keep an eye on my website towards the end of this year, because we've got the Climate Change Conference in Glasgow um, in November, I think it is. And I'll be releasing that work in the autumn to hopefully coincide with that. So we'll see what happens when I do that as well. All right, let's zip through these. I also made a little mini Olympic series because the Olympics keeps Olympics keeps getting delayed. I took matters into my own hands or the little people took matters into their own hands and they, they trained very hard for about a week and they hosted their own Olympics um, using stuff from my kitchen. And we had 10 events. This was the needle throw. He broke the world record actually, that little chap. Um, this is not from the Olympic series, but I do quite like this one. Just a bunch of staples stacked up to kind of create a cityscape with a uh, an aged Elliot flying over them with E.T. Here we are, we're back to the Olympics. This is the staple chase. And we'll see if this work gets used in some capacity closer to when the Olympics do actually take place. I've contacted a few agencies. I'm not sure if it'll get used yet, but keep an eye out for these little guys. They might, they might, make the, they might be doing the rounds uh, later in June, July time. Here's the short jump. He's jumping over some polenta. And we ended with a hundred millimeters final. It was most exciting. Right, let's see what we've got next. Oh yes, what was this one? This was the dog father. That little chap is about three centimeters tall and he looks bizarrely like Marlon Brando when you actually hold him up and look at him. You can kind of tell from that image, I think. And I, I seem to continually dip in and out of the steam of the pandemic. No surprises there, I guess, with what's still going on. I'm still making work every so often about that. Oh, here are the fans from the Olympics. Short breed, deed. Okay, let's let's speed up. We'll go on to some light painting work before we hand back to, to Janie and Megan. There's a lot of these. Like I say, I've made a hundred of these in a hundred days. I'm not even sure how many more there are. Yeah, there's quite a few. Let's. Let's, I'll show you this one. I like this one. This is one of my favorites. This is a thread mill as we all become more creative about how to keep fit indoors. Right. Let's look at light painting really quickly because it's the other thing that I do that's completely different. 
as I mentioned to you briefly earlier, when I moved to Guernsey uh, some 20 years ago and everything went digital, I felt like I had to relearn photography almost from scratch at that point. And that's why I wanted to kind of have a marker, a visual marker in my mind of what I was aiming at. And a lot of photographers in Guernsey are landscape photographers because it's a beautiful island. And the office that I worked in, almost to kind of torment me on a daily basis, was 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 the walls were surrounded with um, with plastered in images of of Guernsey, these beautiful landscape images. And I used to look at them every day, wondering what I was doing working in an office. Um, I've thankfully escaped that life now, but I did that for fourteen years. And after a few years of doing that, and eventually deciding to make photographs again, I started first with landscape work because I could then reference what other professionals were doing and gauge the quality of my images, if you like, against people that were making a living from it. And I strangely, I don't even know why I started doing this, but I think it all started with this mission to kind of create landscape photographs different to those being photographed by the many other photographers on the island. I wanted to um, I wanted to document the island of Guernsey in a very different visual fashion to what was already being done. And so I became obsessed with long exposure photography. Um, even in the daytime, I would add filters to my camera to slow the shutter speed down and slow time down so that each image represented the passing of time. And this became something that I, be I, I slowly but surely became not just fascinated with, but obsessed by. And it naturally eventually led into the world of light painting where I can actually walk into the landscape when it's dark and influence what's going on within the, the image. And that's what I started to do. So here's a, here's a very, light painting can be approached in two very different ways. You can hand hold the camera on a long exposure and move it around physically whilst directed towards a light source to create more abstract designs, if you like, like the one we're looking at. This is a bunch of street lights I was pointing my camera towards at night time. Or you can place your camera on a tripod, which is the most kind of um, obvious and uh, uncommon approach to light painting, sorry. And you'll all, you'll all be able to relate to or at least recognize these images of car light trails, you know, in the dark, where you, you, you will see many images in the past, I'm sure, of cars rushing down a motorway or a street. And the long exposure shows the light trailing through the image. That, that, that describes, if you like, that exactly how the process of light painting works. And when you kind of delve deeper into the world of light painting and become a light painter, here are some of the gadgets that I use to make my work with. I have a huge range of bizarre contraptions. Um, you then become, if you like, the, the car in those images, you become the moving craft holding the, the light sources that then flow through the image. I keep my gear pretty simple. I've got a tripod, a camera, and a shutter that I use to start and stop my long exposures with. I've got many more torches than, than these, but here's a small range of torches that I use. Um, and funny enough, I use the two on the right-hand side there for lighting a lot of my miniature diorama scenes. Bulb mode is what you want to use for long exposure photography so that your camera can surpass this boundary of 30 seconds when you put it into long exposure mode. So it can run and run and run until you tell it to stop. And this is kind of like a really brief tutorial that I'll take you through here, okay? Because I'm gonna just teach you how the process works very quickly in a nutshell. I head out to a location as the sun is setting or the sun has set. I then use the back of my camera, the live view screen, as you can see flashing up there to set the focal point in my image and compose my shots while there's still a little bit of ambient light around. And then as conditions begin to get darker, I then use my torch to illuminate the landscape. In this case, I'm illuminating this beautiful tree out at Millerocky Bay at Loch Lomond. And I'm setting my focal point on that subject matter. And once I've set my focal point, I then switch my focus. This will make sense to those of you that are photographers. I switch my focus from autofocus back to manual focus because I want to lock the focal point onto that area within the landscape because it's going to be pitch black almost when I start making my light painting work. And so the camera must know what, what to focus on. And so I use a torch to help me do that. Here's that lovely little lightsaber tool that I was showing you a few moments ago. Can you tell I like Star Wars? And then I run a couple of test shots just to make sure my gear's working. Here I am standing there energetically moving around the, uh, the lightsaber just to make sure that my camera's in a decent functioning order. I can run my long exposures and it gives me an idea of what the light's doing at any given time, how long I need to run that exposure for. And then once it gets properly dark and the light has completely faded, I'll then run a very long exposure 
or exposures to work out how long the camera needs to run in terms of exposing for the landscape in this instance, five minutes long, okay? To make sure that the light around the uh, subject matter is sufficiently exposed or the landscape is sufficiently exposed. And then once I know that I've got five minutes to play with, I can then decide what I'm gonna do in terms of light painting. And I will then use that five minute period when I take the shot again to walk into the scene and begin moving my, my tools around in the dark, wearing dark clothing, like I mentioned earlier, to help me remain invisible. And as long as I keep moving during the long exposure, um, I can create scenes like the one you're looking at in terms of walking backwards and forwards and repeat with the, uh, the illuminated device. It's a really fascinating process. And we'll take a look at some other light painting images quickly now before I hand back to the other guys. I love working in the landscape when I go light painting. I do. I teach a lot of workshops um, in a studio uh, near to where I live in Coat Bridge. There's a blackout studio, studio there that guarantees total blackness, total darkness during the, uh, the daytime. I teach workshops every month. If you want to find out about them, jump onto my website. They're, they're a huge amount of fun and you get to play with all the weird gadgets that I've got. And again, zero editing with anything that you're seeing here. These, these images are all created in one single long exposure. Um, and me using different light sources to create different designs within the, uh, within the landscape. Light painting gets a little bit more technical. The macro works kind of easier to follow in terms of what the photographer is doing because I'm just creating miniature sets, if you like, miniature dioramas, and then trying to tell a story through the figures. This works feels a lot more kind of conceptual maybe um, in terms of what's going on uh, within the image and how I feel about the work. And they all represent the passing of time. Like I mentioned earlier, this is where my initial passion for this, this art form stemmed from um, and remains to this day. I just love the fact that we're looking at an image that represents a five minute period of time during which time I've walked into the shot, spun lights around or, you know, threw a lightsaber around and then walked out, walked back out of the shot. I'm, I'm as much part of that image as the light is, if you like. The light are the, um, these light forms, these sculptures that I leave behind are the only real evidence that I was ever actually there. I find that whole, that whole process quite poetic and quite beautiful. This image really does give you a strong sense of how much time has passed uh, from the shutter opening and from the shutter closing. Probably close to something like maybe 15, 20 minutes for this one. Maybe not quite. Something like that. And I teach my workshops in schools across Scotland as well, um, which are a huge amount of fun. I think teaching is it's now firmly become one of my favourite things that I do. I, I adore sharing my passion both for the macro side of stuff and uh, my light painting. It's, it's just lovely seeing other people access and learn about these wonderfully creative art forms. There you go, Anne. I told you there were a couple. Um, thanks for this. <laughs> Some of the only images I've got documenting me actually teaching a workshop. Here we are back at the Sterling Photography Festival. And this image was actually made during the festival. You might rem remember it, Janie. And Anne. Okay, I think that's just back right to the beginning of that. Right, there's a good old uh, conglomeration of images to wrap your heads around. Um, we kind of jumped in and out a few different things there, didn't we? So fire away with any questions you've got. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Um, oh, I think we've, it's been stopped anyway. There we go. I can see you all again. So feel free to, to ask any questions you've got. Um, I just want to say it has hit half seven. So if anybody does need to leave, then that's fine. Thank you so much for coming. But we do have some uh, questions in the chat. Um, Millie's asked, how do you avoid catching yourself in the long, spo the long exposure images? Three, three kind of key rules, Millie. So the first rule of thumb is when working in the in a dark environment is wear dark clothing. That helps you merge in with your your backdrop, if you like, the landscape. It helps you blend into the environment. Um, rule number two: keep moving when you're making the work. As long as you're continually moving around when you're light painting, the camera will not be able to form your image within the final shot. And rule number three don't illuminate yourself when you're making the work. So for example, if during the long exposure, I got someone to fire a flash gun or a torch at me when I was running around making the work, I would expose and kind of freeze into the image. And also if you were to just stand still during a long exposure, it, you, would, you would 
start to what's called ghost into the image. Your image would start to form even just in silhouette into the image. So movement, dark clothing, and don't illuminate yourself. Three golden rules of light painting. Um, Gregor's asked, do you use any filters on your lens when you take photos? Only for landscape photography. We've not looked at any of my landscape work tonight. I thought it'd be better to focus on these two more kind of creative outlets and niche areas that I kind of specialize in. I do, I do a fair amount of landscape photography in my spare time, um, not for any commercial kind of reasons. Um, and I do own a plethora of Lee filters um, and Lee filter systems for all of that stuff. Um, yeah, we could talk about filters for a long time as well tonight. It's a complicated business when you get into all of that. But yeah, I'm very familiar with them. Thank you for coming, Claire. <laughs> um, Samantha's asking, have you ever been interrupted when you're doing your light painting um, where people wonder if, like, what you're doing running around in the dark with a lightsaber? <laughs> <laughs> It's, yeah, it's such a good question. It happens. Well, it happens a lot. It happens now and then because I've been doing this for 15 years or something. It has happened a lot. I often, you know, when I, because I learned my kind of light painting craft in Guernsey, it was a great place to start light painting because it's a small island. Um, it's very safe. And you can be out at nighttime on many, one of the many beaches just on your own making the work and you feel very secure and it, like I say it's, a, it's not only a magical process because of what's happening technically in terms of the light freezing into the image but just being on your own under the stars at night time making artwork is there's something very uh, therapeutic about it all but yeah I, I encountered a lot of dog walkers at strange hours and um, sometimes like 1 a.m I would get someone walking up to me in fact I would see them first because you know a lot of these people that walk their dogs at night they've got a collar on with a little light flashing um, in case they lose their dog and I would sometimes, what would happen is if they walked through the shot, the scene that I was photographing, I would get a little dotted red line in my final image because that was the dog walking through the shot. Um, that happened quite a lot. And then they would come up to me and say, what are you doing? And I'd sort of look back at them and go, what are you doing? It's, it's, it's one o'clock, why are you walking your dog, dog at 1 a.m.? Um, I had a good excuse, you know, I just I just got the old, uh, the old lightsaber out and explained what I was doing and, that, that really satisfied them. It just confused them even more. But on a, on a, more, interesting, a more interesting example was one time I was working in a, a block of flats. Um, they were gonna either tear the flats down or completely do them up again. Um, and I got special permission from the States of Gandhi to, to work inside this, this vacated block of flats for two weeks to make a series of images and light paintings in all the different rooms. It was bloody terrifying, I can tell you. Um, oh, it was a creepy place. But on one particular evening when I was up on the sixth floor on my own, um, I kept saying to my friend Ross, who I was with partly for company and partly for insurance reasons, apparently, um, I said to him, I kept saying to him, did you hear those footsteps? I kept thinking, I, I watched too many horror movies and I kept thinking I could hear something in the steps. And then one particular night I said, I'm sure I heard something. And then the door flew open and these two policemen with a very angry Alsatian had me up against the wall um, attempting to arrest me because they... They didn't know, they thought, they thought we'd broken into the building. So I had to very quickly show them the uh, special permission we had from the States to be there. Um, I've had many interruptions over the years with my light painting work. Some more enjoyable than others. That last one was put me off for the night. Super, well, thank you everyone for coming along. Um, huge thanks to David. Uh, for putting all that together for us. It was a pleasure working with you on the poster this year. And uh, for a big thanks to Megan for pulling this together uh, tonight. Uh, this is our first little venture into a kind of uh, Zoom session. So we've been kind of learning about the technology and all sorts tonight. So thanks for taking part in that. Um, and thanks for dialing in from all over the country. It's fantastic. Um, I just want to say thank you again to uh, Sean Sterling, who funded a, a little bit of uh, tech development for us, so it's allowed us to do tonight. So huge shout out to them. And I also just want to also point you to um, something that's going on in town at the moment called Street Stories. And our poster from the year before last is featured there, and it's one by David Galletley, which is on the wall behind me there. Um, it's the giant of Sterling. Um, and that's currently on display window pane size space in uh that's it there yes thank you very much david in uh, the thistle center in sterling if you manage to go in and uh, the animators have done a great job and that even comes to life um 
And a final quick nod to Lindsay, who's with us tonight. Lindsay has an exhibition going on at the Tolbooth at the moment. So if you can get into Stirling, if you're close by and you can get into Stirling, uh, Lindsay's projection exhibition is uh, running at the Tolbooth. It's absolutely brilliant, combining music and uh, Lindsay's brilliant photography. So um, all wonderful stuff, all flowing out of the Stirling Photography Festival. So thanks for everyone for coming tonight. Um, keep following us on our social media to find out what's coming of the programme. We're still awaiting a final funding decision, but hopefully within the course of the next couple of weeks, we'll start publicising what we're doing. So thanks again, David. Brilliant for your uh, work tonight and your work on the poster and to Megan for pulling everything together. Thanks very much. Hope you all enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you. Lovely seeing you, Megan. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye.